Hello, faithful listeners, and welcome to episode 106, lucky number 106. You're listening to the worst people we know. I'm Mike. I'm Jeff. And I'm Sean. And on this week, probably the most important glass ceiling shattering <laughs> moment that's happened in recent <laughs> times. At least recent times that I can think of. It's going to be in the news. We could say that for sure. We have our first female guest on the pod. Uh, And our guest this week is Nicole Lowenbron. Nicole has a degree in uh, communication from Boston University, one of the top two Boston colleges or universities that I'm aware of. (laughs) Uh, master's in speech language pathology. Speech is an aspect of communications for those of you who do not understand education from Hunter College. She works for, uh, Duarte, which is not named after somebody we went to middle school with, (laughs) but is instead a presentation design agency. This is a very, uh, Long Valley centric podcast (laughs) worth mentioning. Unlike so many others. (laughs) After... After uh, somebody uh, who we went to high school or middle school with for two years and used to date uh, sure. blank blank SK, we'll call him SK. No, not um, not to interrupt the introduction, but should we um, look to like advertise specifically in Long Valley? For oh, actually, advertise. Thank you yeah. for that. Thank you for that segue, like on Sean, the ice. because we actually we do have a new sponsor this week. Oh, I'm just like let me let me see if I can uh, find it in my papers here. Uh, Four Seasons Landscaping. <laughs> Four Seasons Landscaping. For presentations, we they're the best. We are a company that does not host events. and <laughs> They do now. Yeah, Four Seasons Landscaping. Yeah, they do now. Did you guys see the that there is, I guess it's a fundraiser run that's been started called the Fraud Street Run in Philadelphia? <laughs> no, no, so, that's great. So, Philadelphia has a 10 mile run every year called the Broad Street Run, which goes down Broad Street, which is, goes right through the center of uh, Philadelphia, north south. And uh, so they're doing a Fraud Street Run that goes from the Four Seasons Landscaping Company to the Four Seasons Hotel in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> Are they far away? Oh my God, I want to do it. Yeah, I, it, great. it's it's a number of miles. I haven't, I didn't like click into the website. Somebody else <laughs> sent it to me the other day. Are they? Um, sorry, that normally we don't do segues through the, in the introduction. Okay. So. Uh, Duarte is a presentation design company uh, as a speechwriter, and uh, Nicole works as a speechwriter and coach for Fortune 500 C-suite executives. Today, we're going to talk about uh, business communications, how they've changed in a post-COVID world, what's good, what's bad, who's good, who's bad, uh, and uh, maybe we'll get some free coaching out of it. Uh, yes. I assume, <laughs> first of all, Nicole, welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to shatter that glass ceiling. <laughs> Excellent. And the first thing I'd like is your full endorsement for um, presentation formats that are very poorly planned and uh, <laughs> go at least 100% over their plan time allotment. Is well, that the best way to give a presentation? I can tell you that authenticity rules in this new virtual environment. And I can there say from it. personal experience, knowing these guys for a long time, that they are nothing short of authentic. <laughs> there you have it. So you've got yes, that going for, for you. For better or worse, you know, <laughs> I think right. that there's going to be a good conversation because um, that's often what I tell young people at work. It's like you can be whatever type of leader you want to be as long as it's authentic to who you are because people can smell poopy from a mile mm-hmm. away. That's correct. Now, I have adapted that to say about 74 million people can smell poopy <laughs> from a mile away. <laughs> and then another 70 million <laughs> They can smell it, but they're they're quite comfortable and filthy. Yeah. <laughs> at, at least now you can just say like uh, a majority. Yeah, true. A majority, like a majority of people. Yeah, yeah. Just wash over it. A little over. So, half. yeah. Uh, Nicole, Nikki. I don't know what what you go by, and when you're on podcasts, do you go by <laughs> Nicole or Nikki? <laughs> it depends on who's asking. You guys can call me whatever you'd like. <laughs> okay. Well, uh, I'll restrict myself to Nicole for now. Um, uh, so tell us about what is Duarte, what is presentation, what is a presentation design agency? Sure. So Duarte is based in Santa Clara and Silicon Valley, and we started designing PowerPoint presentations. We were strictly a design company. And then our CEO and founder, Nancy, thought, well, if we're going to design these presentations and the speakers are going to butcher them, then we should probably start writing the <laughs> presentations. And so we became known as the storytelling 
presentation company. And then she said, well, if we're going to write and we're going to design, then we might as well add coaching and make this a a three-legged stool. And so now we're known in Silicon Valley and globally really as a presentation design company. And we, we cover all matters of presentation design as well as events. I love that because it's like you have a core user and then you say, all right, well, we're going to, we're doing this one thing. That's great. We know that there's a need for this. And then it's like, oh, there's other needs. Let's just serve the other needs of our users, um, which is, you know, the classic good business strategy of how you expand your brand and your business and ultimately your revenue. Uh, So that's fantastic. I feel like the one question that I've always had is sort of, so you guys, you're designing and coaching presentations for like large companies, right? Like, Mm -hmm. you know, Fortune 500 tech companies, a bunch of that we've heard of. Um, why don't they have communications departments? Like why, why don't they have someone to do this? That's a really good question. (laughs) They do. A lot of them do. And we partner with a lot of those folks. A lot of times they're so entrenched in the marketing speak in the language and this, the internal comms that when it comes to external facing audiences, they don't know how to Mm. deliver in a way that is audience focused. And so we remind them that, Hey, the audience, whether they're, in the actual room with you or through a camera, they're the most important people in the room and we give them perspective on that. Sometimes their internal comms folks are so entrenched in saying the same message over and over again that it just becomes too jargony and we we call them out on it. Yeah, and so so do you do both internal comms for them and external comms in their presentations? We do, yeah. I would yeah. say it's it's mostly external. We do a lot of sales decks, a lot of keynotes, a lot of events, a lot of you know general corporate narratives, but we do internal <clears throat> stuff too. Yeah, it's it's an interesting niche because before I got to Silicon Valley, first of all, I never saw somebody who like was planning internal comms i'm sure that they're like if i was at like Heinz, i was at a fortune 500 company um eventually you would have seen that yeah yeah i thought although i thought i was fancy (laughs) (laughs) i assure you nobody was uh planning you know (laughs) internal comms for me even though i did give presentations to quite a few number of people at any given time you just weren't preparing Um, no i i didn't prepare no (laughs) um i think i've told you guys that like the job at, at Heinz is first your job is to do spreadsheets. Then your job <laughs> is to do PowerPoint. And then your job is to tell people to do PowerPoint. Exciting so, stuff. Um, I got to the level before I left where I was doing PowerPoint. And I would say 60% of my time was ensuring that icons were sized properly and a left aligned <laughs> and, and various I, things. This is bef- yeah. what you learned I'd in see business that on school. so many like flights where people would be, they're just like, Going through resizing all the um, all the crap to put it on the sides, and I've I've heard of companies like this. I just had no idea that that people would actually do that work for you because I've definitely put together plenty of terrible presentations or okay presentations yeah. that I spent we way too things, much time on. I would say more on a grander scale. I mean, we'll create PowerPoint templates internally. That's a big part of our design organization. But Mm -hmm. one of the biggest things we've been doing internally lately is crisis communication, because one Mm. of the things we're known for is just having a super underlying empathetic sense of what the audience needs, whether that's internal or external. And even the most articulate C-suite executives are coming to us saying, I don't know how to handle the emotions of my people right now given the yeah. COVID situation. So they've been coming to us to learn how to handle. We have a, a strategy wing too. And so before we before we write these presentations, we often come up with a, a message strategy to, you know. So I think, yeah, there's two parts of that that I think are, are interesting. So one, like, you know, the when I started and I was working at, uh, at Heinz, when I first started out of graduate school, that was 2008 time period. So one, first you're in a conser- conservative culture, Uh, I received um, one of the benefits they used to have was you got to buy uh, your company stock at a discount. And I think it was like at a 30 percent discount. And they changed the benefit to you got to buy it at a 5 percent or 10 percent discount. So it was like a massive change. Uh, I got that in like a two line email one day. And that that was was communicated. (laughs) 
And that was about like the expectation yeah. that that we expected for that. But then you come out to Silicon Valley and there's this cultural change and like everyone's doing all hands meetings every week or, you know, every month, every quarter at the least. Um, and that was certainly the case at like a company like Eventbrite. We had an internal deck guy and that was like all his name's Lawrence. And all Lawrence <laughs> did was he was the deck guy. Right. And he made these like very attractive PowerPoint presentations and um yeah, sometimes they were good. All of the, the the presentations were good. The stories were sometimes good and sometimes not. We could have <laughs> used an external person on that. Um, but then there's the second element of the times that we're living in with COVID where you're like, well, crap, how do I get productivity and focus out of my people when I don't have the ability to check in with them as regularly and as on as much scale and as in depth with, as I might with like face to faces or, you know, walking around the corner and bump ins and then all of a sudden you know, the power and the moments that I do get with them become more important. And so right. I don't know, Nick, if you can speak to any of that or how you've observed that or if, if companies are acknowledging and accepting that. No, that's exactly right. I think they're they're coming to us knowing that they have to have a balance of warmth and strength. They have to tell their people messages in a way that comes across as authoritative and, and powerful. Like we're, we're all going to get through this, but there's also so much emotion behind all of this and they also have to convey empathy and say that I'm here for you and I get what you're going through and I'm going through it too. We've encouraged our C-suite executives Hold on. to Are be- you talking about Duarte or are you reading Sean's Tinder profile? <laughs> because I heard- What now? Powerful and empathy. strong <laughs> and empathetic and- Yeah. Uh, uh, she hasn't said are- tree pose it's yet though, so maybe that's <laughs> yeah, it's probably that's Duarte. Because that yoga. is exactly what he paid me to write for him. That's what <laughs> oh, everyone's that. looking for, Sean. You are on the right track, buddy. You keep it up. I knew, I knew one was well hiring, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> um, no, but we're oh, encouraging wait, senior executives to be vulnerable in ways that they don't feel comfortable with and the ways that they never have before, because that's what their teams need right now. They need to feel like we're not alone and our CEO gets us. Mm. And I am here with you. Except a moment. Yeah, you are somewhere not alone. I'm the Oracle right. CEO and... <laughs> You're still working. Well, but, yeah. <laughs> that, that's the thing. Talk about authenticity. It is outside of their comfort zone in a lot of ways. And so we have to balance authenticity and being genuine with mm, giving your people what they need right now. It's tough. Yeah. yeah. I'm frustrated too. My 27 person <laughs> crew who is running my super yacht. <laughs> Like a couple of those we guys have problems, tested positive. You know? I have and to manage there. my own technology <laughs> yeah. in my kitchen and it's yeah. not working very well. Well, that's very I, frustrating. I think that's probably, I mean, obviously, I think for normal people, that's the biggest thing that's changed, right? Is, is that now all of a sudden you're on your laptop all day, you're talking to people over Zoom all day. Um, is that like. Is, was that some motorcycle coming by, Sean? <laughs> Certainly wasn't oh, yeah. me. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> that was loud. Anyway, yeah. um, like the biggest change is is this. Is this different? Like, so are CEOs having to like relearn how to like talk to people because they clearly don't do this often? And like, what are the what do you see them doing? Just like kind of trying to do what they used to do. It's fascinating. I had. Uh, executives that had speaker coaching packages with me that were stalled because of COVID. We couldn't travel anymore. And they said, you know what, let's put this on hold and wait till this is over. We all thought this was going to be a three month deal. And then we realized it wasn't. And instead of waiting, they realized, well, I need help with virtual communication. I'm exceptional on a stage or I need, you know, a little bit of work on a stage or in a boardroom person to person. But wow, I have absolutely no idea what I'm doing in a virtual setting. And it is different. And the audience requires something different. So guess what? We're going to resume that coaching package because I need different advice. It's been really interesting to watch. I would imagine, I mean, you're usually giving people coaching for like they're on stage and now they're sitting in front of the computer. Mm -hmm. And you got to do stupid things like pick what room you're going to be in. I mean... what was it? NVIDIA. I think the guy was in his kitchen for most of the thing. Mm-hmm. A lot of the NFL guys, you see you see stuff like that, which is strange, but I guess that's part of it. Yeah. So we've seen a lot of interesting things. I think these virtual events and virtual presentations, public facing, especially fall on a spectrum. 
So we've seen Apple, for example, and Snap put on these really explosive, super high production virtual reality events, and we've been blown away and we've loved it. And then we've seen quite the opposite, where CEOs have literally shed tears in their kitchen and been completely vulnerable, and we've loved that too. So it all depends on what you're going for, what your content is, and who your audience is. Mm. Tim Cook can't cry, I don't think, either. Who can't? Tim Cook. He's just Tim Cook. Like a, a robot. <laughs> he does seem like, very, yeah, non-emotional. Um, the, I think the the big question we're all wondering, right now we're using Google Meet. What's the best? I assume you've used a lot of them. I've been forced to. Yeah. So what's, what's the, what's, can you rank all the virtual uh, communications? I don't know that I've used all of them, but I will say because of where we're based geographically, we work with most of the major tech companies that you can think of. And of course they all have their own video platform and we're forced to use them all. That's mostly for, for meetings. <laughs> Honestly, I think whatever you get used to is what becomes your preference. Internally, we use Zoom and we prefer Zoom because I think that it has more functionality than some of the others. I think a lot of them have caught up in COVID times. They've realized they've had to to be competitive. But there's a lot of interactive functions on Zoom that allow people to maintain engagement because you know you're competing with their inbox. You know they're competing with kids afoot and spouses you know, doing dishes in the kitchen now. And so there's the ability to annotate a slide with a heart stamp or a check mark. There's ability to, to write on the slide if you're a participant. You can give polls and take surveys and the chat is a little bit more interactive. And we've really enjoyed it internally as a team. And now their virtual backgrounds have gotten a little more clever and the, the graphics have gotten better. So that's my preference. Have I definitely you, have some ones that I hate, but well, I think we all know the the one that's the worst is what is it? What's Cisco's one? Web Web-X. Webex. Well, I haven't Web-X, used that in a while. The, I think the defense of Web, Webex is you used to have big video conference rooms in your office, and they had the cameras and the boards, and Webex could interface with mm. all those different things and make a seamless thing. You could call in on the phone. You could be on your if laptop. You had you like a mere two hundred thousand yeah. dollars worth of equipment but that's what it it, we work. used to think that was like the way it was going to be or remember even right. like people conceptualized like a smartphone way long ago like a facetime but it was going to be like this glowing orb you looked into <laughs> you're like oh, no it's more like a little brick you carry on your pocket but we we get the idea yeah, i thought we'd be in the hologram space by now <laughs> yeah, but right <laughs> apparently not yeah, where's Hooli when you need him? With yeah, Hooli? right. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> God damn it. But did, did Zoom um, just launch uh, like an app store within that or like a third-party developer? I thought I saw some news about that, but I haven't used – I only use Zoom. Like I, I don't host anything on it, but I thought they were putting like something out there that people could start developing their own essentially apps, I think, plugins for uh, Zoom. I heard something about that, but I don't know too much about it. I mean, the the one I think of when you say that is mm-hmm, which Nikki, mm-hmm. I'm, I, mm-hmm. Nikki and Mike have used this, correct? I got a beta for it. I actually got to talk to the guy. Uh, Nancy, my CEO, reached out to him, and man, that's a cool product. <laughs> it's just a super cool product. It works best if you have a, a green screen and the whole shebang. But there's some. It fun- works second best if you're making four minute YouTube videos that are summaries <laughs> of one hour and forty minute podcasts. There you go. Like you, like they do on the TWPWK YouTube video oh, you channel. Oh, you guys should Just all check example. that out. Yeah, it's a great. <laughs> yeah. It's a great YouTube channel. In, in case you're interested in. Mm-hmm. Are we, are we <laughs> great so example. what's we super mm-hmm super super cool about that platform that I haven't seen anything else do is that the speaker can look as if they are physically interacting with their slides, as if the slide is behind them in the room. And yeah. now, because there's multiple layers, you can bring in another remote person, even if you're not in the same room, and you can look as if you're co-presenting with the same screen behind you. So it makes the audience really feel like those presenters are co-presenting in the same (laughs) space, which is exactly what we're lacking right now. It's really neat. Maybe we should do that for our our potential live stream that we've been talking about for our our live event. Or the uh, what it made me think of, have you seen, there's like YouTube videos of the news where it's just weird animation. Yeah. Well, yeah. wait, animation of the news? It's like an anime like news animation that's 
it it's basically like that. I was thinking we don't have to use ourselves. We could have these avatars they have, but I think it's just like a really cheap 3D animation. If we could get computers to do our work for us, I think <laughs> I, that's I'm all that's for that. Right you, you know, we idea. got we, we often get it to do that, and then we just create more work for ourselves. I think that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Like, okay, computer, Jeff and do this work. I were talking earlier. Oh. The the one thing they say that will not be replaced by computers is speech writers because there's a certain amount of emotion and storytelling that you have to use a human for that, you know, there, there could be a, a certain formula or algorithm that AI could, could use and, and plug in, but it just, yeah. it's never going to be what humans want it to be. Well, so, so I feel so like you that's seen, a good job security. Have you seen their articles that say they're generated by like uh, AI? And then I think sometimes they're lightly edited, but they say it's like the same as, any article that's written like would get some editor's overview. Have you seen those? I Are haven't. I, that doesn't surprise okay. me. I can't imagine that they're that good compared to some uh, of the stuff that we there, produce. There but. were, there's a lot, like a lot of financial ones that don't matter because it's like, you know, you, right. it's that's a, formula. a program, you right. know what the outcome that's right. is. It's a formula. Yeah. But there was one, I forget what the topic was on, but it was something more like an open-ended question that was asked to come back, like write, write an opinion piece on, blah, 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 but I forget what the topic was. But I had read it, and it read like, not. I'm not saying like, I don't know if it was great writing, but it yeah. wasn't like, me do think that this is good. You know what's thoughts. interesting is I think that, so I'm Jeff's going to say something much more insightful than me because he's probably read a lot more about uh, artificial intelligence than I have. But um, one of the weird quirks of the internet is that people end up not just writing authentic, interesting intellectual pieces. They write crap that uh, SEO engines uh, will read. Mm -hmm. And so, is, you know, is a piece of SEO optimized? I could see if you, like, fed a certain number of keywords into a thing that you could get a really good AI bot to write something that is not that has some sense to it. It's not nonsensical and could actually develop pretty good rankings through machine learning to to get at Google. It's funny you say that, Mike. Uh, I just applied <laughs> for a beta today to try to do exactly that. Um, so the, the, the big, quote unquote, big uh, news or whatever hoopla in the AI community lately is something called GTP, GPT-3, which is open AI. Uh, I think it's the ones founded by the Google guys or Elon. I forget who exactly all founded it. But Better find they out. Created... One is a potential house of cards, and the other is probably good. <laughs> <laughs> so, the they created this. They, it's a. It's basically a. It's an API, which means like you can query it with things, and it will come back with things. And you can basically tell it to do certain things, or give it like say summarize this article, and it will attempt to do that. And from what I've seen everything is like very impressive. Like it actually does a pretty good job. So the idea would be to like have it respond to that sort of, yeah, sort of, sort of my, read my emails and reply to them. Pay my bills, please. Um, (laughs) You do video summary so I can just watch it. (laughs) Okay. AI, uh, just, uh, can you do this podcast for me, please? Um, But uh, yeah, no, it's, there's a lot out there. It's just, but I do think, I mean, Nikki is certainly correct in that you're not going to get a lot of emotion um, and like powerfulness out of that. But for bullshit financial news, it's oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah so the, the financial news, it does better than people, I think, because you don't want any emotion. Well, yeah. Right. Just right, get, exactly. Give me the information and get yeah. get it done. That's yeah. right. It went up. It went down. Right. Well, yeah. uh, when when I was at this firm, Majestic, where we were writing financial reports. A lot of our reports were quite literally changing numbers and making sure the wording was last last month it went up, but we would have to tr- change that to something more creative this month <laughs> yeah. so that it wasn't exactly the same, but it was more or less exactly the same. The previous month. <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> Accelerating. Crushing. Yeah. So, um, Nicole, you've seen this like, a lot of different presentations, a lot of different formats from the perspective of like, let's just consider internal communications for uh, a minute. What are the, like the most common mistakes that people make in trying to bring points across to large groups of people? I would say 
the assumption that they're there to just inform rather than persuade or motivate. Mm-hmm. I would argue if you're just there to inform someone, well, then you can send an email. Oh, uh, this is the, sort of the, the beauty and the, the problem with working with tech folks is that, you know, a lot of them have engineering backgrounds. Sorry, Jeff. Losers. <laughs> Losers. Mm-hmm. And their training and education has taught them to give all the details and just the facts. It is just, this is, this is how it is. And yeah. we think, no, like there, there's day. a, there's a general purpose in you being here with a room of other humans and you're trying to get them to act with something. You've got to get on their level and you can't just give them information. They're not going to do what you want them to do. So that's yeah. been a, a major point of contention and also acceptance. Uh, the yeah. second thing is it's sort of connected to that is is being too analytical without bringing in some story. We're finding more than ever that humans really love stories. There's some Forbes study. I think it was like 55 percent of people retain stories more than any other piece of information. And it's hard to get it's hard to get people to use stories. They feel really vulnerable. They think they need to use something personal. And that's just off the table for business. Well, there's a lot of different ways that you can use story. You can use a customer story. You can use a business story. You can lie your face off. You can, yeah, you, for, <laughs> yeah. for the purposes of getting your point across, yeah. sure, I, I wouldn't, you know, be against that. Um, but those are, those are the main things we push against from a content perspective. So, like, all of this is incredibly interesting to me as somebody who occasionally represents themselves as a professional marketer. Um, <laughs> and so <laughs> it you know, it just hits on, like, some of the very core foundational <clears throat> 101 things everything is built off of in terms of hey, you have to get their attention first. You have to yes. have some you have to have a message that's persuasive and emotion is more persuasive than just facts. Um, you like. The two things that are like when you're creating an advertisement that are the two metrics that you would look at and say, is this going to be an effective advertisement um, is uh, recall and persuasion. Right. And so like uh, recall, you you need to be able to kind of jar them out of like all of the noise that's uh, affecting them. And uh, it needs to be something that's memorable and easy to remember. And then persuasion um, that really does kind of require you to trigger some emotion. so I love everything that kind of you're saying because it's so consistent with like truly the academic literature, mm-hmm. um, hard to do on like a, a, a day-to-day basis. Um, I don't know, Jeff or Sean, like have you guys ever had to speak in front of a, a large group of people? Oh, yeah. It's terrifying. <laughs> it's absolutely <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> it, it was... uh, what's the largest group of people, Jeff, that you've ever spoken in front of? Um Probably only a few hundred. I mean, a wedding is probably the biggest it's like public yeah. speech I've ever given. I, I got the funny part is, I mean, like anything, I guess you get used to it. And I'm an introvert. So like, I don't in, at all like public speaking. Um, but I had to take a public speaking class in high school. And I was terrified to begin with. And then by the end, it was like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. And I feel yeah. somewhat similar with this podcast is I feel like because we've gotten used to once you got comfortable that this like people are actually listening to this and it's like oh well it's kind of the same thing i could probably speak it in front of a group now but at weddings i mean i legitimately like it's like it was a movie where like i got up there i said words i blacked out i don't remember any of it and i stopped and i was like i'm glad that's over how did it go everyone like oh you did great i like that part i was like i don't remember that i don't remember any of it like i'm just glad it's over so you might love this analogy i don't often now at this point in my career work with people who feel extremely nervous because by the time you get to be a senior executive you're used to this kind of thing but I always like this analogy of, of sports. I mean, all of you have played a sport at one time or another. And you think of the adrenaline you get before you rush onto a court or a field. And for some reason, in sports, we're trained to think that that adrenaline means we're ready. And in business, we're trained to think I'm nervous or, you know, in a stressful situation mm-hmm. like a wedding, we're trained to think I'm nervous. It's the same stuff. It's just a matter of what you right. do with it. You have to repurpose it and use that energy and give it to your audience and don't hold it in for yourself. But what I do when I see people that are nervous, I mean, I just I watch their body language and they clench up and they hold it in and their their fists get tight and their jaw clenches and you think, uh, don't you wouldn't do that if you were running onto a field. Your arms would open up and your chest would open up and you'd be running and you would expel it. You'd send it forward. 
So run more during so public run, well, speaking. It, it, yeah. Satya hey. Nadella, the, the CEO of Microsoft, is known to do burpees backstage before he goes on it. And I love that. <laughs> You have to find whatever is going to fuel you. For some, that's calming down and doing a meditation or breathing exercises. And for others, it's revving up. It's doing burpees or listening to Beyonce or whatever gets you going before you go on. Yeah, we had at FBN, we have an annual conference of farmers. And I want to say that there were 5,000 maybe at the last one that we were at. And there was an individual whose name I will not say who he was like threw himself up against the wall, was doing upside down push ups before he went on. And he's like, I just got to get this energy. I got to get this energy. Like right. he was like completely revved up, right? Tony Robbins. Um, yeah, it was Tim Robbins. Tim yeah. Robbins. <laughs> what? Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, Tim Robbins, the guy who was the pitcher in Bull Durham. <laughs> no, Tony Robbins. No. Tony, Tony. Tony Robbins. That's what you're talking about. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. When Nikki was talking about burpees, I'm like, this got to be like a pre. Yeah, pre it does Tony sound Robbins. like a Tony Robbins yeah. thing. It does not sound like a Satya Nadella thing, but no, apparently right. that's that's what he does. Yeah, that's what he does. There you go. That You know, like I can, I would say that I can't really, I would say probably in high school at the Mr. Central competition is probably the largest. <laughs> okay. So that's that like 300 that, or more. More. Uh, probably 500, oh, I'd okay. say. The entire auditorium was I mean, back, it was Mr. So probably, Central. Yeah. It was a big deal. Yeah. Was, yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, Mr. Mendham. It was Mr. Right. Central yeah, yeah. altogether. Good point. You know? Yeah. We're, we're a section <laughs> three school for the sake of Pete. Um, so... That was probably 500 people, and I've definitely, in like a business context, spoken in front of a couple of hundred, and, you know, I haven't, the way that you were just kind of describing some of that, Nicole, changed my perspective on it, because um, there's, I definitely, like, I feel prepared beforehand, I'm not nervous, you know, at all, and then, like, you know the first speaker goes through and the second speaker goes through and then like, you know, you're up next and all of a sudden your heart starts beating. Yeah, that's right. Okay, that just (laughs) happened. And I was like, all right, like I got to like start biting my lip or doing something, right? Um, And I always, shockingly, right? Like, like to tell jokes and like I, in my head before this conversation, I thought, oh, you know, like I, I like to do that because it wins the audience over. But I think maybe I like to do it because it gives me confidence. Like, okay, they don't hate me. They think some of my jokes <laughs> oh, they're laughing. Yeah. Are actually and are okay. I mean, going back to <laughs> authenticity, that, that works though. I mean, if, if that is appropriate yeah. for the audience, that makes you feel better. It probably makes them feel better. I have a lot of- Oh, I'm sorry. Appropriate? That does not feel my <laughs> right, right. I don't tell appropriate I forgot who I was talking to. Yeah, no, 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 no. Should know better. <laughs> they are very a priest and very a porn graphic. star walk into a book. <laughs> yeah. It's funny in this virtual environment. I got a lot of executives who say, "What do I do when I can't feed off my audience's energy?" That's what I do in a real life yeah. setting, and that's super challenging. But my argument to that is, well, you set the tone. You know, what do you what do you do when your audience, whether you're in person or not, what what do you do when it's like seven a.m. on a Monday or seven p.m. on a Friday? You're not gonna get what you need. It is your job yeah. as the speaker to set the tone, and your audience will follow that. So you you know, fake it till you make it work. Sometimes the feedback thing is actually like another amazing point that's so interesting that you don't kind of think about frequently but it's come up so many times since covid has happened for me where like and i'll think about like pre covid right when you're on the phone on a conference call right so sometimes i'd have to be on a conference call with people who are in five or six different offices right and i'm saying something that is impassioned and meaningful and this is a really important project um and you know like i'm not just telling them, hey we have to do this right cuz like they have we have, I don't know, 40 people on the call. They've got a bunch of other idiot brand managers who are 29 years old telling them that they have to do their stuff too, right? Like they have to prioritize my thing. And so I got, I'm telling them like, this is how much the financial impact is and how it's going to like make the company be all this, like you're trying to find motivation or whatever, but then you shut up and all these guys are on mute. Right. So <laughs> That's it's just right. like, <laughs> you know, yep. so like, you, hear you know, you're like pouring your heart out and like you got half your face is covered in blue paint and you're, you know, yelling your freaking Braveheart cheer and then you're greeted by silence. <laughs> and like, you know, like, at the end of it, you should be like, somebody tell me 
that what I just said <laughs> mattered. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, like, this is where Zoom can really help. Hey guys, I know everybody's multitasking. Give me give me a, 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 a stamp, give me a heart stamp or a check stamp on this slide if you're yeah. on board. You know, s- send something in the chat. You can be interactive. Um, we get this a lot. People either say, hey, how do I prevent myself from being interrupted virtually? Or how do I prevent my how do I prevent myself from hearing crickets on the other side? Well, it's your yeah. job as the speaker to set the the expectation up front. I don't think people are being jerks when they interrupt you, and I don't think they're being jerks when they don't say anything. They just don't know when it's their turn to talk because you haven't told them. And yeah. so it's yeah. your job as the speaker or the meeting moderator to say, hey, everybody, I'm gonna talk for about 10 minutes and then I'd love to hear your feedback. Or mm-hmm. this is gonna be a dynamic dialogue, and I would love and frankly expect you to chime in. Um, videos are on everybody. When we're on virtual calls, everybody at Duarte, we can see their face. And that makes a huge difference. It holds you accountable for participating and for, for maintaining attention. So other things that I've noticed also from like a communication standpoint, one of my jobs, I was living in Pittsburgh. My boss lived in California. The person who reported to me lived in California. My boss's boss lived in Pittsburgh. And I would be in these rooms and like with six, seven other people in Pittsburgh and my boss is talking or whatever. And he says something that they disagree with. (laughs) You just see all of them roll their (laughs) eyes. And I was like, oh, and I was like, hey, a-holes. If he was sitting in the room with you, there's no way that you would just do what you just did. Shut the F up. That's the beauty and the the damage of virtual communication. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. So, so other, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, so we talked about like, you know, CEOs giving presentations and I'm sure some subset of the listeners certainly need to give a presentation at some point, but like from the day to day, you know, and you could talk about however you want to talk about this, like tech setup to to eye contact or, you know, whatever. Um, How, how do you, how does, because you're not doing in-person meetings anymore and people are on zoom all day, like what, what's, what makes a good zoom presentation what makes a bad one i mean obviously you should have like palm trees in the background we all know that (laughs) or penguins something like that but other than that what do we got yeah voice has become the most important tool that you have from a delivery standpoint because whether you like it or not your audience is multitasking and so to draw them in and bring them back we have found that voice is the most important thing That being said, the way you frame yourself in the camera, your background, whether it's real or virtual, and your lighting can either distract your audience or draw them in. So that has to be considered as well. And it is shocking to me how many people still don't know what we call in the design world the rule of thirds, where your eyes should have a direct angle to the camera, your eyes should be about a third of the way down from the screen, and the rest should be your torso. It's also it's important. almost as if these guys didn't take photography one. I know. Can you imagine <laughs> such a thing? But there's just there's no reason for me to see up your nose or or or, or any part of your ceiling at this point. It, like the we've ceiling been is in hilarious. COVID times for eight months. Like I have three cookbooks under my get, my get laptop your DSLR, to make sure that the cameras get your at the right. Canon hand. connect. And well, and like a, and a decent microphone and a decent room that yeah. doesn't sound like shit, like yeah. does make a difference, I, right? I'm amazed even on TV shows you see where it's like, if it's like the Daily Show or other late night shows on network TV, they have guests on that are affluent people with people that <laughs> help them out and they have terrible <laughs> echo. They have terrible, yeah. Like, yeah. It, it's, it's strange. If we can maybe do Maybe you it. don't want to accept that we're in this for the long run. Yeah. So they, yeah. they didn't upgrade in that area but well and listen i mean talk about empathy we understand that hey these folks have entire families working from home like you have kids at home you've you know grandparents at home there's there's dogs (laughs) (laughs) that explains so much conveniently lock yourself in the garage or the basement and forget about them which is totally understandable but you know so i think there is a certain amount of leeway that we give to people but when you're giving a more formal presentation or you're leading a meeting like come on you know just we know you're not at well, the top of the Empire State Building. <laughs> Cur- curate your your real background. Don't make it distracting for folks. So I don't want to take too much for granted. So let me just ask a couple of questions about some of that. Okay. Next presentation. Yeah. Shirt on or off? 
Well, did you do push-ups beforehand? It's <laughs> it's all about your audience, Mike. Point. So the first question you need to ask yourself is, would my audience want me to leave my shirt on or off? And then you have your answer. Literally pop that shirt off. <laughs> That's a great question. It might be related to my next one. Jeff Tobin exposing himself. Good strategy? <laughs> Hmm. No, I think that uh, his his bosses and colleagues felt otherwise. <laughs> Not good. Okay. So fair enough. Okay. So shirt on and pants on. Then. Shirt on okay, and pants so it's a, it's on. And mic off. Please, situation. for the love of God, when you go to the restroom, make sure that you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> Do oh, not take yeah. your camera with you. I, I do struggle with that because I'd say I, I'm not on too many like conference calls these days or uh, meetings, but I used to be on ones where you could like go in on your computer or dial in. I would dial in and Mm -hmm. put on headphones and I'd be unloading the dishwasher, doing all these things in my kitchen. Oh, yeah. Now it's like everybody wants the camera on, which is probably good for all the reasons you mentioned of keeping people engaged. But I also don't know that I love that that cultural shift like it used to be. Nobody would turn cameras on. And even early on in this, people weren't really doing that. And now it's just like, yep, look at my crappy background or hope maybe I've got a fancy background. Maybe I've got a podcast Dungeon blurred out background. Um, yeah, but people are. Well, just... this, is a, this is a question for Jeff, is, or, or like for related to Jeff. Hmm. Um, if you're doing a podcast for tens of thousands of people, should you just get up and pee in the middle? <laughs> yeah, I mean, obviously. So the thing is, do, would you rather just pee in the chair or get up and pee? And I <laughs> generally are, choose. If those are the two options. It's all. It's all about the uh, the mic or the camera. That was Nikki's tip anyway. Or you wanna, I like Sean's point, like, though, because I think Zoom fatigue or whatever platform you yeah. use is super real. And we've resorted in some cases for our one-on-one meetings, for example, to doing it over the phone and just making mm. it audio so that we can get up and walk around. I mean, I'm someone who's used to traveling around the world to do events and speaker coaching, and now I'm sitting at a desk, and I don't yeah. like it. I'm not used to it. It's I don't have enough contrast in my job. It's getting real boring. And yeah. I need a change of pace to keep up my creativity and to make sure that I don't just tire out by the end of the week. So it's okay for those unimportant meetings to just say, hey, is it okay if we just do this over the phone or turn the camera off? I'm, I'm Zoom tired. That's okay. I think that that's true for, I mean, now it's probably true for everybody, but there was a time when some people's jobs, they might be meetings like 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. Yeah. Right? And it's just like, Listen, some of these are going to be important, and some of them <laughs> I am here through. just to make sure someone does not say something crazy that costs us ten thousand dollars. <laughs> <Like, laughs> right. That is the only reason I'm on this call. I am not participating. I'm just babysitting. Yeah, and it's okay to block out your calendar for uh, you know a half an hour, an hour for lunch, or block ten minutes in between meetings. I mean, we've started haven't really adhered to this very well, but we've started to institute the fifty minute meeting rule because you know people need to. P for Jeff's point and eat yeah. and grab a drink yeah. and tend to their children. And it's just, it's ridiculous to have back to back. We assume that because we don't have to travel anywhere that we can do that, but like our brains are still tired. Well, that's, uh, I think there's a massive difference in like a two or three hour meeting in person when you're like hashing things out and drawing on the whiteboard yeah. and eating and doing whatever. And a two or three hour Zoom call is excruciating. Exhausting. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're just sitting there. Well, you had one the other day, right, Sean, or today? This morning. <laughs> this two morning. hours this morning, yeah. Yeah. Ugh. And what is it yeah, about? And- I mean, you just feel there's something about the camera where you feel like you have to be on. I don't know what it is, but when you're in person, somehow you feel a little bit more relaxed. Maybe because there's more people in the room and you don't feel... We can move around more. Yeah. I you know, know. all it's- that stuff. It's tough. Well, and there's there's one thing I struggle with is just the communication in, in a meeting like this. And I've gotten used to it in the podcast somewhat, but it's people that I've known most of my life. So it's easier to interrupt or talk over. But there is, there's just not that energy. <laughs> and I think you mentioned that uh, yeah. too, Nikki, where you're in, and I don't know how to interact in these things where if I was in, I, I feel the Zoom fatigue, I'll be on it for work. Maybe I'll FaceTime with family or friends and that's great too, but it's like, oh, I'm tired of looking at this and I'm just watching you sit on your couch and I'm sitting on my couch. And, <laughs> right. This isn't that exciting. Then I'll get to like, uh, I, I'll take exercise classes, yoga classes on Zoom and it's just like, I get tired of that. But just even understanding how to um, interact with people, it's a weird energy. Like you're, you see these people, but you're waiting. It's like, you're waiting for somebody to pass the baton to the next person to talk. If you were in a room with them, you just you could feed off of them in a meeting. There's a side conversation about this or that. And it just, I, I don't know. And I don't know if you have tips on even how to facilitate 
discussions better. I've been on some where we've had like a, a big family Zoom meeting just to catch up with a bunch of cousins. And we'd have like one person would ask like, go all the way down from oldest to youngest. And that that's how you had to do it. <laughs> but it, we would never do that in real life or in person. Like, Yeah, it's a little awkward. And I think on the event side of things, that's what people are really missing. You can yeah. make these virtual events from a speaker standpoint pretty good. You still still get the same effect generally. You the, I mean, you don't the get the theatrics of the lights and the, the sound mini-mile. and the... Yeah, I, I think what people are really missing is the networking. It's just what you yeah. talked about. And that really is really difficult to replace. I mean, there there are some platforms that are trying to have these sort of virtual tables where people can go into their individual chat rooms and have small conversations, but there's no replacement to meeting someone in the hallway you know, if I if I go to an event and I see someone right. that I, I coached before and I shake their hand and I meet their colleague and I give them my card and I have a drink with them, like there's just no replacing that. And that right. I think is what everybody's really missing. What about, uh, have you used house house party a bit? <laughs> I have for, not used house they party. They need like house party not. business or something. It, it, right. Like for the house meeting? Well, <laughs> there is some stupid thing and I'm gonna, you're gonna be shocked who introduced me to this um but it's called something lunch i'm gonna look it up right now oh it's called lunch club oh if there was an oh. app called lunch oh. club who do you think <laughs> would have introduced me to that i know exactly I who introduced you to that because i got the same invitation probably the same person that sent that invitation to my mom Oh, <laughs> I love that guy. Mom. Hey, if you're a woman who's approaching 70 and you want to randomly meet 25 year old for business uh, networking Valley Aww. people to talk about, uh, I'm pretty sure he just blasts all of those things out to his entire contact list. But so obviously, yeah. we're talking about uh, longtime listener, sometime guest, uh, Julian Scursi. <laughs> Obviously. Extraordinaire. <laughs> but I have actually done Lunch Club is um it's a club where in the pre COVID times it was literally um you would go and you would have lunch with these people and the idea was it's low impact uh social networking and they see all right, I want to meet people who know about uh whatever, art- artificial intelligence. I want to meet other entrepreneurs, I want to meet um somebody who is in the restaurant space. The, they would meet like set you up and you just do a 30 minute call and I've done probably I get an email from them every week um, and I've probably done four or five of them and they're actually sometimes pretty interesting Julian probably does four a day and uh, I get referrals from his calls like once a month which is nice uh, so I get the benefit of his lunch clubbing um, but that is an, an interesting sort of thing like house party for business is that's what that made me think about it Sean I like that is that like a one-on-one it is a one-on-one yeah exactly and then, like, you basically, they set a deadline. They say, hey, sign up for new connections this week, and they'll send it to you on, like, a Monday. And, like, you have 12 hours to say, yeah, I'm in, and give time availabilities. And then, like, if it works to match you up with someone, then they do. And and most of the time it does because I'm assuming they have enough people on the platform. But I've met a couple of people who were doing entrepreneurial things in the restaurant space um, that was, like, was pretty good to have a conversation about. And, you know, in Silicon Valley, most people are doing – Things that are at least somewhat related to technology and raising yeah. money and wearing Patagonia vests, so you have something to talk about. Oh, almost one hundred percent of the time. Is that the uh, the Heather, the gray Heather vest on there? Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah. wonderful. Oh yeah, yeah. I I got a Heather that, and Mike, I got. That's what you need to be. Become like a a secondhand Patagonia dealer because I think some of those guys aren't allowed. <laughs> depending on who they work for, they're not allowed to buy directly from true. Patagonia anymore. Yeah. Oh, that's that's a good point. I keep getting advertisements for uh, some swag companies. I'll tell you what. If there's two things, if you put CEO on your LinkedIn profile, here's what you're about to get a lot of. <laughs> you're you're going to get advertisements for like random swag for your company. <laughs> and you're going to get sense. random like LinkedIn recruiter mail things from people who are trying to sell their offshore uh, other companies dev looking to hire a CEO stuff. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's like it's mostly like, "Hey, uh my name is XYZ. Uh I'm just trying to expand my network 
And everyone's just trying to expand their network, it turns out. There's a lot of people who, once you become a CEO, they're very interested in expanding their network with you (laughs) and uh, then trying to get you to hire their random uh, people that they know in India to do dev work offshore for you. Mm, Yeah. I I get get probably three of those a day. I get a lot of like, let me help you with sales. I don't know what my LinkedIn profile, it's probably, there's probably founder in there somewhere. So yeah, it's like, let me help you like grow your business. There's like a million of those. Um, mm-hmm. I don't get the swag ones though. That's it's interesting that they would do that to a CEO. It's like who's making decisions on like what vests people should wear. Uh, the CEO I'll be fair. Goes that could be GSS that. related and various uh, things maybe. that are printed for either GSS or, or WVS. So <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair. A, a different. It's because I order a bunch of magnets, but hey. <laughs> so, yeah. um, Nicole, like, and there's another question. She's like, have you seen anybody doing anything that you're like, wow, that's really creative and that's really interesting in kind of like a virtual world where it's like, I wouldn't have thought of that. Like, I should recommend that to my clients or I think that that's like something that's that's pretty cool that other people should adopt. We've seen a lot of cool stuff, but the problem is that there are these huge tech firms and not everybody has the budget to do that kind of thing. They're working pretty heavily with post-production companies. I mean, a lot of these event company or a lot of these events that are happening inside companies are pre-recorded now. They're not live Mm -hmm. when they're virtual because there's so much post-production work to make it look super Mm. cool as if they're in this event space that um, they just don't have the dollars to produce stuff like that. Not to mention... These events used to be money makers, and now that they're virtual, they're not charging for them because no one's going to pay for them. That is right. insane. Like uh, you think about Eventbrite how much they is charge. trying to make a business around that, though. Who is? I said Eventbrite. I see they have like some things oh, there for like yeah sale virtual. Yeah, I just I, I I think once the trend became we're going to put this content out there for free yeah. out of the goodness of our hearts because everybody's suffering and working from home and there's so many unemployed and. Y- you're 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 a total jackass if you do the opposite. Nobody's charging for these events that they used to charge for anymore. Well, and so they're losing that. money. So you're selling I should sell my Eventbrite stock. <laughs> <laughs> it depends on what they're doing from a virtual perspective, but that's a th- it's like they're using this to get information out there and to get their name out there, but not only are they not making money, it's costing them money to produce this stuff at a at a high end. So we're not recommending it to anybody. We're, we're saying like, hey, events are on a spectrum and you do what you can afford. And as long as you give the audience what they need based on your budget, you're good to go. And I think that's true. Um, you know, we're not going to suggest to uh, smaller companies that they go the Apple and, and Snap route with this virtual reality awesomeness. They can't afford it. Oh, something I do hear you say a lot is like, it's about the audience. It's not about you, mm-hmm. which obviously makes a lot of sense. But I feel like that's something that applies to almost the entire like ladder of this situation. Like if you if you talk to someone on Zoom, a lot of the times they're staring down at their keyboard or they're mm-hmm. staring off into space. They're never looking at the camera right. because they don't want to look at the camera. That's not what like that doesn't help them. Right. And it's like, no, you're talking to somebody like you should be looking at the camera to give the impression you're making eye contact, even though you're not. Right. And like. Those type of things, I'll, I'll ask the follow up to Mike's question, which is like, so you can put like fake eyeballs on your camera, fake eyeballs, googly eyes. Well, That's it's funny right you say that. So my CEO Nancy, because she's like, I don't want to look at that little green dot. One, it's so friggin' small, it's really hard to focus on. And two, I don't feel like I'm talking to actual humans. She has yeah. printed out people's LinkedIn profile picture, taped Ooh. them on popsicle sticks, and put them on the back of her laptop, so she feels like she's talking to people, which I think is brilliant. But yeah. even something simple as like take, you know, whatever screen you're, or whatever app you're using, like move it to the top, move it so that the person's face is right next to the yeah. cameras. And that's the beauty of Zoom. Not all user interfaces with these, with these virtual video platforms have the ability to do that. And that's what makes it so hard. So uh, Teams, for example, I figured out the only way to drag that small box up to, up to the top is if you minimize the screen, you get a box super, super small, and then you can drag it up to the top. You can't see everybody. You end up seeing one person. But some of these user interfaces haven't caught up to the idea that the eyes of your audience are through the lens of the camera. We need a, Hey, Jeff, a I realize camera. that I'm saying this while you're sitting next to um, your girlfriend. Uh, but do you remember when... We, the one person who you've brought this up multiple times where you're like, 
the charisma of this individual always impressed you. Do you know what story I'm talking about? It's an individual that used to live with Julian. <laughs> used to live with Julian? Yeah. Uh, the other Julian? It was. I think it was the other Julian. Okay. I think that that was the person. Um, so, yeah, Julian 2.0. <laughs> and he had upset some this is when we were younger people who were uh unmarried as one of the three of us was i guess those old two of us <laughs> were still unmarried um, but we were out somewhere and we with a group of girls and um one of them got upset and he this guy stopped everything and he goes hold on this is not about us this is about you. <laughs> like, what, what, what is, he's like, what can I, this is, this night is about you. What do you need? Let, we will make that happen. It's like, that Did was like work? just attention to his audience, <laughs> authenticity to who he was. Like it was, and he diffused the situation immediately. Oh. Um, and that was just great presentation skills, but that was a one-to-one. He was brilliant. He's brilliant mm-hmm. at that. It was very authentic in the way that he was like a, fake individual who didn't really have any feelings <laughs> of his own. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's the other thing. Sociopaths can be great presenters too. <laughs> uh, well, I feel like all this presenting talk means we're going to try to get some free advice out of this. So, I hope so. I mean, which one of us talks the best? Which one of us has the best <laughs> words? Um, all of the normal questions for presenting. Is that what you usually critique people on? Yeah. I say, you are the best with the words. You are the best with this. You are the worst with this. No, most talkative. Um, <laughs> most yeah. talkative. I mean, the best has to do with quantity, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that a superlative that you got uh, senior year? I'm pretty output. sure it was. Yeah, most it was. Talkative. He just brought Me? that up last week. <laughs> yeah. It did come up last <laughs> did week. Did it yeah. really? That's yeah. Funny. He got most talkative Why somewhere. I remember that, I don't know. I, don't I would actually much. like to see an analysis of, and this is actually a fine execution of a machine learning algorithm, so maybe you should just roll the last 105 episodes through through that little uh, mm. thing you're talking about, Jeff. Um, who, What the, the charts would say of number of words per episode amongst the three of us. Mm. That's a good question. I mean, I guess my order would be me, Jeff, Sean. But I would like to see the magnitude. This is the other benefit of Zoom is that when you record, it gives you an audio transcript. And so you can see not how many words, I don't think, although I guess if you copied and pasted it into a word doc, you could probably figure that out. But you could definitely see blocks of text and figure that out. Hmm. Well, I've been on some and it shows like, I think it was Uber Conference, which I'm not quite sure what happened. And they definitely capitalize on this yeah. COVID time period, but they would show you, it's like, this is how long each person talked on the call. So you could even see that. Like That's great knew, like, analytics. This call is 10 minutes long or an hour long and 10 minutes per person or however much they showed it. This yeah, person it really... talked the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they ran it through the AI. I could tell just by the <laughs> radio waves how good their talk was. <laughs> well, without naming names, I will give you maybe maybe three different vocal exercises or vocal things that you should pay attention to since this is an audio only coaching session (laughs) which makes it a little bit easier unique new york there you go (laughs) and so i'll start with that because one of the things that i advise people on is what we call articulation Um, as mike mentioned up front i'm a speech pathologist by trade and so my main focus is on voice I work with a lot of folks who speak English as a second language or who have an accent. And while speech pathologists are trained to eliminate or reduce accents, I say that's (laughs) hoo-ha. I think that accents are awesome. They make you interesting, unique, and a little mysterious. And frankly, Americans love them. Um, But whether you have an accent or not, articulation is really, really important on virtual calls. And that simply means opening your mouth a little bit wider and rounding your lips and working really hard to form the words if you think of stretching them out. And there's a way to practice that. If you're on a Zoom call and you don't see your mouth moving very much like mine is, and chances are you're coming across like a total mumbler on the other side. If, on the other hand, you practice as if your audience is hard of hearing and you work hard to form the words, then they can understand every syllable crisp and clear. So articulation. So it's the same advice as a maple syrup chugging contest. <laughs> It's the little bird lips you got there. (laughs) Yeah, but I think, you know, 
we're so go, 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 and we all talk really quickly, you don't necessarily have to slow down as long as you speak sharply and we can understand you. Mm. Um, I would say the second biggest thing that I work on is not sounding monotone. You do not want to be the guy who puts everybody to sleep on a podcast or a call, and too many times I don't hear enough intonation or vocal variety or ups and downs. There's a couple different ways that you can punch your words. You can change the pitch of your voice to isolate a word. Pitch perfect. You can change the volume. You can get quieter or you can get louder. Either one works. Or you can isolate that word by pausing before and after to make it really stand out. Um, But we find that consistent speed, whether slow or fast, makes things really boring and contrast is the key when it comes to voice. It's the old stutter step. That's... uh... (laughs) I think Jeff's dad taught me that in basketball. Yep, along with the crossover. Mm -hmm. And finally, the thing that so many people come to me about is eliminating verbal fillers. And I always use the, (laughs) those ums, uhs, likes, and so's, you know, is right, actually, there's a lot of them now. A lot of people say, oh, Nicole, like, I want to eliminate my verbal fillers. I'm like, great, how how are you going to do that? Well, I, I equate this to quitting smoking because if you focus on the behavior that you don't want to do it's going to be really hard to stop instead you have to focus on the replacement behavior so you replace smoking with gum or the patch or more food or exercise or something to stop verbal fillers you have to focus on pausing silence is the key to eliminating verbal fillers because all those things are doing are giving your brain a moment to think as you're talking. And if you use the silence to think and you won't have those ums and uhs and you'll be able to come up with something smart to say. I still, and we've done, what, 105 episodes now? I still feel like there's, I need to fill silence. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's awkward. It's real awkward. But I'll tell you what, if you are the one person in a meeting or a presentation who uses silence and looks like they feel comfortable with it, that's pretty powerful because nobody does it. Hmm. So don't talk. I used to use it <laughs> to be an asshole in meetings. <laughs> so Oh yeah. So I have I had a the CFO of the company I worked for in New York had a now this is second hand through someone who this may or may not be true came from this guy because he didn't like him, but it was a brilliant tactic and it was basically awkward silence it was stand there asks ask an open-ended question and just stand there and wait for that person to answer and just like just make it awkward just don't say anything and that person will likely tell you more than they would otherwise they'll tell Mm -hmm. you things they they might maybe shouldn't tell you and like that was like a strategy he had and it well, that's worked. a strategy from uh, a previous guest on this podcast. Uh, Kenny McNutt was talking about one of his recommendations was that's right a book. It was a ne- negotiating like your life depends on it or something like this. I can't remember what the name of it was, um, but that's one of the strategies is that if you use silence, people be- they have this innate desire to fill the gap, and they'll start to give you more information and more information. You can use that information to you know get to the outcome that you want. Um, I would use silence. Um, because someone would ask me a question and it it would start not as like, I'm trying to use this as a strategy, but it like from just like the purely authentic standpoint of I'm trying to come up with a response that doesn't involve me <laughs> verbally murdering you. And so I'm like, I can't say what my initial thought is. So I'm just sitting there in silence. I'm like, I will be able to formulate something, and I'll sit there and like you know without the F word. Okay, by. I'll try. And they'll start to they'll start to say something. I'm like, stop. I will let you know when I am ready to respond. <laughs> <laughs> How did that work for you, Mike? <laughs> I mean, I I don't work in a corporation with other people anymore, so that's probably one indication. <laughs> um, I think you know you it's it's something that you there's there's both effective communication and there's likability and then there is impact and it was certainly effective for impact like there was no and it for clarity there was no lack of clarity at the end of the meeting where i stood on a particular subject and it like you don't want to overuse that right mm-hmm. this is the other the idea of like one of the things that matters in communication is um 
the messenger and your equity with the person who or the audience, right? And so, like, whether or not you already have trust, so you, you, you build trust. If you have built a bunch of trust up, then you can burn that equity to hell, as I often did, down to zero. <laughs> um, <laughs> but um, the if you're going to do something like that where you know that it's going to ruffle feathers – but will be effective for getting the message across. You just need to understand that you're spending your equity to get that done. And the thing that you need to get done um, needs to be worth it. Mm-hmm. right? Um, and so the other thing I like to say in general about leadership, which is, is somewhat connected to communication, is uh, leaders stick their necks out. And sometimes that means you get your head cut off. Mm-hmm. Um, so like that's that's just, and that is related to my personal authentic leadership style, um, which is like there's a lot of authenticity in it because I'm from New Jersey and I don't know how to shut <laughs> off the, no, dumbass, we're not doing that. Uh, it's called or, not having a filter, yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, like, and like in response to this particular people, like this is definitely now just my psychology, it has nothing to do with communications at this point, but like there was... I was thinking about this today as I was running through something because my, you know, sometimes my wife and I talk about work and communications. And um, I was thinking about a conversation that we had with another uh, sometimes guest on the show, Mark Blankenfield. And I was describing at a steak dinner this conversation that I had with a guy at Eventbrite. And uh, he, after I, I, told him this anecdote he's like that was the most new jersey thing i ever heard because <laughs> i was like i was like this such a blah, blah blah situation situation and then like i just like completely naturally blah, and then this fucking guy comes out <laughs> gabagool <laughs> gabagool you know uh, maron, you know and so uh but that can we, can is we just sometimes... say too, like it's New Jersey and Italian, Mike. Let's be honest. You and I are both half Italian. Yeah, These guys it. don't get it. <laughs> they he, don't get listen it. to the way this guy says Gabagool. He just he Gabagool-y. can't possibly understand. <laughs> <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with it's Halloween. Terrible. Gabagool. <laughs> <laughs> Sake of Pete. Jeez Louise. Uh, um but yeah, you know what? That's that's um, authentic to who you are as well. And it's funny because I run into people out here and when somebody says something that's very forward, I'll be like, you're from New Jersey? Like, How'd you know? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. it comes you're up not from so the Bay fast. Area? <laughs> right? Not being yeah. passive aggressive? You know? Yeah. You know, my mom used to say this where people, when she was in Long Valley and she'd be people in the office, somebody was like, Irma, why Why do you and Karen always yell at each other? She's like, what are you talking about? What are you? It's, like, it's just like, that's just the volume by which people communicate to each other across the street from in Queens. Yeah. Sure. It's like how you, yeah. yeah. Across the street is the same hello. thing as across the office and you just yell it and that's how it happens. Uh, so anyway, yeah. it is what it is. I did want to- Should we move it? I wanted to circle back to the speech, speech pathology mm-hmm. thing. Um, you, you mentioned before we started- why do people ha- hate the sound of their own voice? Mm, yeah. Because uh, well, I definitely experienced that until I had to listen to it every goddamn week. Then yeah. you get used uh, to it. Then I get used to it. But like the first the first couple weeks were rough. I was like, oh, that's what I sound like? This is terrible. It's really weird when you record your outgoing voicemail and you listen back to it and you say, yeah. what the hell? That's what I sound Who's like? That? That's terrible. So I'm gonna be, I'll, I'll geek out on you for a second. But... We hear two different ways. We hear via air conduction, meaning the sound waves out in space hit our ear directly. And we hear our own voice that way too. But we also hear our own voice via bone conduction, meaning the bones in your skull and in your ear literally rattling inside of your head, changing and sometimes magnifying the sound. When you play it back, you're only hearing via air conduction. And that's why it sounds different to you and so strange. Unfortunately, that's the way everybody else hears you. And so it's just something you have to get used to. But I fight with people all the time when I record them because you can't learn unless you really see yourself. I mean, as a coach, I could tell you all day long, hey, you should do this and that. When you see yourself and you hear yourself, that's yeah. when things really click. And people push back all the time. I hate watching myself and I hate listening to myself. Well, you got to get used to you it. You got to do it. Yeah. You got to do it. There's no other way. Otherwise, you're just pretending like that's not the way you sound <laughs> that's like. Right. And that's not the way you look like. Yeah. 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 It's not you that hates the way you sound. Everybody hates the way you sound. <laughs> <except> <laughs> that's you kind of exactly like it when you point. are talking yourself. And that's why Everyone everybody likes it. to talk. <laughs> <laughs> I also, I can't help you with your looks. My theory on that though is actually that like when we're when you're younger, you 
think about how you sound and you shape your voice to how you want to sound, except it's not really how you sound. It's how you sound in your head, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And, which That's is right. different, right? And so it's like you may think, oh, I sound nasally. I need to speak deeper or whatever, which is completely different from how you actually sound when you're recorded. And like you could think back to like when you were like, 10 or 11 or something and maybe other people aren't as vain as I am but like used to walk in front of a mirror and be like I'm walking like an idiot like no girl's gonna like me like, right, right like, right. Wait, like ten, you're, 10 you're, or 11 you're, or you're, like you know, insecure <laughs> now huh? 10 or 11 what? or like 39 40 like which oh no yeah. I don't even do we not have the conversation about I don't wear shirts or pants on calls like, <laughs> 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 but 10 or 11 I did I cared a lot um, and I think that you do train yourself to say, oh, yeah, this is what I want my voice to sound like at some point. And then at some point, it just like that's just what you accept it is. And then you hear it on on tape and you're like, oh, crap, I sound like a fool. Well, you can manually my- manipulate your voice, but there is a danger in doing that to an extreme where you're, you, you can actually cause damage to your to your vocal cords. Like, who is the mm. gal from Theranos, Elizabeth? Oh, Elizabeth Holmes. Yeah, yeah I, the danger I cannot, is that you raise a hundred million dollars. Cannot listen to her. I cannot do it. It is terrible. So she's is, forcing herself. That is not her real voice. And and a lot of people have commented on it. It's not <laughs> normal. And I, I think, but that was her plan. She wanted to sound more authoritative. Yes, right. Well, there are ways to do that and still maintain your own natural register and be on the bottom level of that without sounding crazy, frankly, and without doing damage to your vocal cords it's not smart but to be fair going back to your point of you should be authentic she is authentically crazy mm. so, she's authentically crazy i would argue that's not her authentic voice and uh, well how do you keep that up all I don't the time know. like i don't it, know i understand if that was like okay i'm presenting or i'm a singer and sure. this is how i do this if you're just pretending to everyone you're around for 12 hours a day yeah I, I don't even understand how you keep that up. That just seems either. exhausting. But anyway. God bless America. Moving on to recommendations. Recommendations. Nope. Yeah. Schwaney? Uh Dave Chappelle. He's like resurfacing in recent years. Uh, I just saw him really on Saturday is. Night Live. And then that inspired me to watch an episode of My Next Guest Needs No Introduction with Dave, David Letterman. And he had Dave Chappelle on. And he far- or filmed it at his friend's farm in Ohio. And I remember he left like Chappelle show. People thought he moved to Africa, went crazy. Like nobody knew what was going on. Disappeared, resurfaced somewhere in Ohio. And I never really understood like why Ohio and what was going on. He's still a pretty uh, personal, uh, close to the chest kind of guy. But the interview was good. And he explains where he lives in Ohio. And it was kind of cool. So I- I'd recommend uh, checking it out. Was now all right. So I turned what I thought was that on one night, and then it yeah. was instead you got, of him, uh, Kim was, Kardashian. Yes. Yeah. Oh, I was you got to go to episode user four. Error, user error. <laughs> I was. <laughs> it was. I was going to say it was false advertising. <laughs> that, that, yeah, so that's why I'm advertising this, or that's why I'm recommending there this is, particular episode. The show could be terrible in general, but this episode is. But there is an episode with just him. That's how yeah. that show works. Because I it's thought just, it was like, okay, do I have to sit through like 10 minutes of oh, her and then no. I'm going to get 10 minutes it's, of him? Each guest has their own full episode, like okay. 40 minutes, an hour. Gotcha. Um, oh, I'll definitely watch that then. Yeah. But yeah, you can you can go around. There's no sequence, no order to the episodes. You won't be like, oh, I'm in the Dave Chappelle episode. I wonder what Kim Kardashian <laughs> wonder had to say about him. <laughs> I'm completely they lost. mostly talk about Kim yeah. Kardashian. Yeah. There's yeah. not a big plot. Uh, my recommendation this week, I don't know that I've ever made this recommendation before. We're 106 episodes in. It's possible. Mike, but, if you did, um, we'd know. That's true. Well, somebody would know. Um, made to Stick, which is uh, a book that I, I assume Nicole knew about, and I see her nodding, so she does. Um, double Secret plus bonus. One of the people who wrote it was a Duke professor. Um, but it is a really solid foundational book around messaging that is memorable and how to create memorable messages. Um, Having said that, I can't remember anything from the book (laughs) except like the first chapter. (laughs) Um, That part sucks. There's a story about commander's intent. And I've used that story so many times to people in, you know, what are you trying, when you're trying to communicate internally at work. Uh, And it's the idea, it's an idea that's taken from, um, the the military where they talk about 
um, no battle plan survives the first shot of battle. And so at the top of kind of a battle plan, it's like, hey, we're going to take this hill. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to flank these guys. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. And it's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But at the top, it's like, the point is we take the hill. If we can do all this crap that we think we're going to do, great. But if that doesn't work, just figure it out and take the damn hill. That's what you need to, to, to be able to take away. Um, and that's always kind of like what I communicate to people of like, don't bury the lead, right? Like it's like, make sure yeah. that what you're trying, the thing that you give a crap about is up front and everything else that you talk about is reinforcing the thing that you want them to walk away with. Uh, so made to stick, great book, pick it up, tell your friends. All right. Jeff. Nice. Mine is, uh, my octopus teacher. It's a documentary on Netflix about a guy who swims. He goes, he's from South Africa, swims every single day and then basically follows this octopus around that lives in this little cove where he lives um, and like gets to be friends with it. It comes out and like greets him and then he follows it around while it's hunting and like the whole thing, he basically follows its whole life because I think they only live what, a year or something like that? Um, Anyway, it's just like- Octopuses? Octopuses, yeah. Octopi? Well, obviously- Different kinds. The octo. Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say you are not uh, a big watcher of the Netflix children's show Octonauts because <laughs> that's where I learn all my facts about. Well, octopus teachers play a significant role in that. There's a character <laughs> named named Professor Inkling, who is uh, that's probably a squid well based named. on the inks. Yeah. I don't really know. Um, but he has a mustache and a monocle, and I can't imagine that if you're getting corrective lenses, that you only live a year. That's like, a good you've, point. You've been on, yeah, you've been I, in but, the ocean. But it's for like, a while. Eight, like some of them are like eight years. They don't live all that long. Um, yeah, yeah. one year per arm. Everybody knows yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, one year per <laughs> arm. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, if it's a cat octopus, then it's nine lives per times eight arm. years. So yeah, it's nine that's times a lot. seventy-two. That's a pretty good it's, move. That's pretty good um the animal science and just it's just science right there um yeah anyway it's on netflix it's a it's a nice kind of like good you know learning about how the environment works and he's kind of talking about living closer to it and all that all that good stuff but with a nice little story involved and does the octopus wear a monocle or no this one does not uh it did have a mustache i believe um but no monocle Mm, yeah i think which was weird because she was female. Yeah, really weird. But, you know, yeah. there are different species. <laughs> That's just how it works. Listen, I'm not going to say that my grandma had a mustache. <laughs> she didn't. Yeah, she's nah. Italian, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nikki. Oh, brother. Um, mine is Gooder Sunglasses, G-O-O-D-R. Since I've been down here in Florida, I've been enjoying some runs, but it's quite humid here and I've gotten quite sweaty. And my normal sunglasses were slipping right off my face. So I did a little bit of research and these guys boast this plastic coating on their rims uh, so that they don't slip and they're super light and they're like UV protection and all of that. And they have the best and funniest marketing ever. Their sunglasses are either $25 or $35 and they have the cleverest names and I can't say enough about them. They are perfect. They do exactly what they say they're going to do and they're awesome. That's... I. I saw two guys came to the WBMI one year, I think in Florida, when they were on the flamingos with flamingos, gooders, like micro printed into the pattern on it. And I've wanted a pair since then. I just haven't gotten around to ordering. Wait, it. So who, that's, who that's had those? Hear. I didn't know they had those. I think um, um, two guys. Do you want me to say their names? Oh, two guys. Okay. No, that's <laughs> fine. You can tell me later. One guy from Colorado and one guy from New Jersey. <laughs> oh, okay. Mm. All right, shameless All right. plugs. Uh, shameless, shameless plugs. plugs. TWPWK.com. Uh, yeah. Check it out. Great. Follow us on uh, on YouTube. You can find a link there. We've got seven subscribers, but if we have 10, there's a special surprise coming. <laughs> special surprise. <laughs> It'll be a surprise to us, too, when, yep. when it happens. <laughs> Bookcasecoffee.com. That's where you go for coffee. And dashydash.com, that's where you go to sign up to get your restaurants analytics rocking and socking. And for a limited time, while we don't have that many customers, personalized emails from me telling you what you should be maybe looking into as opportunities to grow your business. Jeff. Very nice. Uh, mine is thebubbleboard.com, a uh, place to follow your stocks. There's been uh, 
some wild swings in the market these days. Oh, Today market. was a big down day. Yesterday was a big up day. So, uh, yeah, you can follow them at thebubbleboard.com for free. Carnival Cruise Lines, huh? They were Carnival and Hawaiian Airlines was up 50% yesterday. Rising, rising tide, apparently, even lifts the airplanes. Yeah. Well, it's because of the vaccine. Well, so they're being tanked back sense. a little bit. Okay. And Zoom was down 20 So we're all going to Hawaii, apparently. That feels yeah. like that was predictable. How did I not so have... I was, I, guess, I was thinking the exact same thing. I'm like, this is obviously when the vaccine gets, gets announced... But the reality, though, is that Nothing we're not going back to normal so tomorrow. Like, like Zoom, the Zoom was either super overvalued or yeah, like right. something doesn't make sense there. But yeah, but I'm so shocked at like the degree of that move on one announcement it's, of the vaccine is it's like all the toilet here. traders on Robinhood guys. I mean, that's, yeah, well, there you go. Just like, oh, this is it. Uh, Nikki, ebooks. What do you got? Yeah. So, for those of you who want more information on mastering virtual communication, I wrote a quick ebook. It's very visual and it's delightful to read. It's not just about delivery, it's also about content and text setup and how to design your slides for the virtual world. And it is on our company website, www.duarte.com under the resources tab. Enjoy. Very nice. Question. Yeah. Did you write it as a book and then you had to go to your electrical engineering boyfriend to make it an ebook? <laughs> no, I have designers for that. Uh, no, we. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. I wrote it directly in PowerPoint. We have a beautiful template and I have lovely designers at my disposal. So she has a feather quill that she writes <laughs> on parchment. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess to close out the episode, um, Nicole, do you have a message to any of the young girls out there listening who are inspired by your appearance on The Worst People We Know, <laughs> smashing uh. the glass ceiling, and hopefully, you know, removing a barrier for future guests? We would love to have uh, more women on the podcast. Uh, we try to present a feminist view and. You're wearing you a know, pink shirt right now. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm wearing I do, a pink I do my shirt best. and my, a headband. My, and a headband. Super my girly. hair is not <laughs> it's almost a, as long uh, as mine. Uh, traditionally masculine length right now. So, well, um, ladies, these guys aren't yeah. so bad. They see they seem it, but they're not so bad. But I, my, yeah. my advice to the to the women out there comes from a speech pathology perspective, and that is get rid of the upward inflection because it's really annoying. And it's my goal in life as a speech pathologist to help you all get rid of it because you are robbing yourselves of your authority and giving. Everyone, a bad name. <laughs> that is annoying. Yeah, that's that. Yeah, I think it's appropriate that you finished on that note, Nikki, because that was the last line of the Tinder profile that I wrote for Sean. <laughs> not that bad. <laughs> this guy what I don't not want. That bad. Yeah, girls, you have valley girl accents. Um, Absolutely. <laughs> well, long valley girl accents. Long yeah, those are okay. <laughs> those are okay. All right. All right, guys, that's the episode. Nikki, thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you for guesting, Nicole. Thank you. It was fun. It was wonderful. It was very enjoyable. Um, mm. I think it was one of our better episodes, which is saying something, because we've done 105 perfect episodes yeah. up to this now. is perfecter. More girls. <laughs> More yeah. perfecter. All right, everyone. <laughs> Talk to you next week. Bye. 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 The Worst People We Know was recorded, edited, and produced in the Golden State. With a little bit of help from the Sunshine State. The Sunshine State. Gorgeous. Thank you for listening. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and find us on Twitter at TWPWK. Thanks. Uh, yeah, Such you should gentleman. probably... Yes. No, don't do it. I'll just clap and both microphones will pick it up. Okay. Nice. On the T and two. Don't do one of those low claps. Yeah. As soon as this guy's done screwing with his microphone in LA. Yeah. Don't do one of those low claps. Do it up high. <laughs> Five, four, three, two. One. Okay. Nailed it. All right. Hopefully Any both questions, got Nicole, that. before we get started? I don't think so. Good work. I did have Good two quick work. follow-ups, though. Uh, Nikki, did you mention yeah. your senior superlative?
I oh. was the cutest. Cutest? Whoa. Yeah. That, that doesn't bode well for our podcast, though. We, we're going to have trouble promoting that. That's true. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is my voice cute? That could be. Yeah, I right. also told Jeff, his verbal filler, when you guys are droning on and on, or when there's too much silence, he goes, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, well let's not move do on that on anymore. Uh... Raining it back in here. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for listening.